It's a great honor to be with President Kagame. And we have uh, had tremendous uh, discussions on Rwanda. The job they've done is uh, absolutely terrific. We have trade with Rwanda. Uh, and just general, I would say, great relationships. Uh, I want to congratulate you, Mr. President, uh, as being the new head of the African Union. That's a great honor. This was just announced recently, and uh, that really truly is a great honor. So please give my regards. I know you're going to your first meeting very shortly. And please give my warmest regards. But it's an honor to have you as a friend. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, it was a great honor to meet uh, the President of the United States, uh, President Donald Trump. And uh, we had good discussions uh, on those two levels. Uh, the, bilateral relations uh, between Rwanda and the United States. Rwanda has benefited tremendously uh, from the support of the United <coughs> States in many areas where it is in peace support operations we have carried out in different parts of the world. We had the United States on our side supporting us. They have supported our economy in trade, investment. We see a lot of uh, uh, Tourists from the United States, visitors sure. coming to Rwanda, and uh, President, I wanted to thank you for uh, the support you have received from you personally and the administration. And uh, we are looking forward to also working with the United States at the level of the African Union, where we are carrying out reforms at the African Union so that we get our act together to do the right things. and. That helps in cooperating with the United States. Uh, it would be more beneficial when we are organized to know what we want from the United States sure. for that cooperation. So I thank you very much. Well, I thank you very much. And it's a great honor to have all of you here. And uh, we'll speak for a little bit longer. And thank you very much. Thank you. For Good evening. And thank you for coming to our first postings here in Leeds. I'm delighted to be joined by so many members of our party at an event which sold out within hours. During this stage of the Conservative Party leadership election, we have a full program of hustings across the country. And in every nation of the United Kingdom, we are giving you, our members, the chance to put your questions to the candidates. All these events are available online too. So welcome to those of you joining us virtually. And thank you to LBC for partner, partnering with us today, broadcasting to your loyal listeners. It is right that we start our hustings here in Leeds, and not just because both candidates have deep connections with this part of the country. Leeds is home to our excellent new Northern Conservative campaign headquarters, playing a vital role in getting the Conservative message out across the north of England. And in the last few days, I've been getting out and about across Yorkshire, campaigning with Conservative activists in places like Dewsbury, Morlin Outwood and Rother Valley, all seats that will be key to the next general election, and I've seen the strength of our party's grassroots. We've all seen the incredibly strong slate of candidates for this contest. Together, the most diverse range of candidates for any leadership election in British history. And we've shown once again that it is the Conservative Party which stands for opportunity and meritocracy. No shortlists, no quotas, just hard-working, talented Conservatives delivering for our country. I am staying neutral in this contest, as are all of our hard-working party staff. But I do believe that we have two fantastic candidates, either of whom can take this country forward and tackle the big issues that we face. Labour would love to have a female leader, but we could, be, we could be about to have our third female Prime Minister before they've even had one. <laughs> or our first Prime Minister of Asian Heritage, the second Conservative Prime Minister from an ethnic minority background after Benjamin Disraeli. having either Liz or Rishi as our leader and our Prime Minister would be something to celebrate in modern Britain. And we should be proud of our long history 
of this party in leading our great country. We are the world's most successful political party. And that is down to our ideas, down to our members, and down to our record. Our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has shown that a Conservative government can rise to the challenges of today. Getting Brexit done, delivering the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe, protecting 14 million jobs during the pandemic, and leading the world in supporting Ukraine and standing up to Putin. That is a truly historic record with which our, our new leader can build upon with the support of party members. Before we he hear from each of the candidates, let us remember why a strong Conservative government is so important. The alternative, of course, is a Labour government, likely in coalition with the Liberal Democrats and the SNP. Such a government would risk the integrity of the United Kingdom. Labour would have never got Brexit done. They voted against tax cuts for low-income families. They voted against additional investment for our NHS. And they voted against protecting our borders and tackling vile people smugglers. They campaigned to make Jeremy Corbyn Prime Minister, who would have taken us out of NATO. And now they want Sir Keir Starmer, Captain Hindsight, the Remainer-in-Chief, to run our country. When Labour last left government, they admitted there was no money left. And no Labour government has ever left office with unemployment lower than when they came to power. That is what is at stake. It is our next leader who must relentlessly continue to deliver for the British people. Focusing on getting on with the job in hand, leading the way internationally in standing up for our ideas, standing up for our partners on the world stage, uniting this country and uniting the Conservative Party. Now, I know you all want to hear from the two candidates to help you decide who to choose should take our party and our country forward. So with no further ado, let me pass over to your host for this evening for the first uh, leadership contest, Hustings, here in Leeds, LBC's Nick Ferrari. Thank you. Here we go. Okay. Andrew, thank you very much indeed. I'm only going to take about a minute just to tell you exactly uh, what we have planned for you today. First off, obviously, thank you uh, very much. It's an absolute pr uh, privilege uh, to be here and to bring you this very important hustling, the first one. And as, uh, as, as you've already heard, this is when the pundits and the pollsters take a back seat and the people who really matter, those of you in the room, you get to make the decision. And thank you, Peter, Peter Booth, for referencing my colleague, uh, Ian Dale, who did such a brilliant job last time. I know we all want to send our best wishes to Ian. He sadly fell off a stage at a book festival recently. So, no, it's absolutely true. So we send him his best wishes. Uh, when we see what's happened to someone from another broadcast, it seems to be catching. But I tell you, if I go down, I'll take the whole stage with me. Don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah, it's not for the faint-hearted then. Um, enough of the earrings. It's time to have a proper hearing from the candidates. Let me tell you how this works. You will hear. Uh, from both of them in a video in just a moment, and you'll hear from supporters of them as well. I ask a few questions, but you are going to do the heavy lifting. You will do the main questioning, and I will make sure that I'm scanning the room all the time. There are three fantastic people wearing white uh, 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 hoodies, I think, and if you can sort of wave, that's who you need. You need to gain their attention. There's one waving over there. Thank you very much indeed. I don't think you're wearing white, but never mind, you'll do anyway. There's one waving over there. So look for these people who are waving at you. Ah, thank you, thank you. There's another wave. So when it comes to your turn, wave to them, and that's how we will hear from you. Uh, try and keep your questions uh, as brief as you can, and then we can get through as many. That's it. I'm done. So let's get into the process. Thank you again for the privilege of being here. Ladies and gentlemen, supporters, please welcome the Right Honourable David Davis, MP. Thank you, Nick. Good evening, everybody. It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Rishi Sunak today, here at the very first hustings, quite properly held in Yorkshire. Today, we face the most important decision the Conservative Party can take, the selection of the next Prime Minister. That Prime Minister will face a number of crises, some known ones on the day he or she takes office, and unforeseen ones in the future. 
That's why our new Prime Minister will have to have great courage, great intellect, and a strong, consistent set of principles. I've known Rishi Sunak for a long time, and I know him to be a man of great honesty and integrity, great intellect, and real conservative principles. But he's also a brave man. Back in 2016, he and others were told by the then Prime Minister, David Cameron, that campaigning for Brexit would seriously damage their career prospects. As a result, of course, a number of ministers either went quiet or campaigned for Remain. Rishi backed Brexit anyway. He put his country and his principles before his career and took that decision. Later on, in 2020, we had to deal with COVID. As Chancellor, he was amongst the first in the world to design and implement a rescue package for the whole British economy. I'll make no bones about it. It rescued our country. We talk about 12 million jobs, but it rescued our country. The IMF described that package as amongst the best in the world and indeed the fastest into play. He faced a completely unforeseen, once in a century problem and dealt with it with courage, imagination and effectiveness. He made it happen. And he continued to face tough decisions up until this very day. So our new Prime Minister will face difficult, unpredictable challenges. And for that reason, we should choose them not just on policy, but on character. Rishi understands that we have to take di difficult decisions today for the sake of our own futures and for the sake of our children's futures. He stands for true conservative values, patriotism, fairness, hard work. He is the candidate who can restore trust and unite both our party and the country. It's Rishi who can beat Labour and deliver another general election victory. Today, polls regularly show only Rishi beats Keir Starmer. But more than that, much more than that, polls come and go. Rishi is a man who can outthink all our opponents, Labour, Liberal or SNP. And in the three largest polls ever taken, the public clearly think that Rishi would make the best Prime Minister. And I agree with them. That's why I'm backing Rishi Sunak, not just to become our next leader and next Prime Minister, but because I believe he will be a truly great leader and a truly great Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Fantastic to be here in Yorkshire. Now, this campaign has been absolutely brilliant. I've been having the time of my life over the last week, being out and about across the country, talking to all of you, talking to all our members. The weather's been fantastic, so we've been in so many people's gardens. The sun has been shining, so much so that someone even said to me the other day, wow, you've got a great tan. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm standing here tonight in front of you all for one simple reason, and that's because this country did something absolutely incredible for my family. It welcomed them here as immigrants. 60 years ago and allowed them to build a better life. My dad was an NHS GP. My mum ran the local chemist in Southampton where I grew up. And they brought me up with a set of values that are absolutely core to who I am today. Now the first of those values is that family means everything to me. The bonds of love, sacrifice, commitment that family brings are far greater than anything that any government could ever replicate and we should never forget that. My family also believed in hard work as the way to get ahead. I worked in my mum's shop. I delivered prescriptions out to elderly patients who couldn't come in and pick them up. I worked as a waiter in the local Indian restaurant all because that was how we moved forward as a family. And for my parents, the best way 
to provide a better future for their children was through education. And that is why they saved and they sacrificed to provide a brilliant education for their three children. And it's why today I believe that the most powerful way we as conservatives can transform people's lives is through education. So those patriotism, service, family, hard work, aspiration. I think they're probably all of your values too. And that's because they're conservative values. My story is a conservative story. And that's why I want to be prime minister. I want to put those conservative values into action for our country. This country allowed my family to provide me with a better future and fantastic opportunities. And that's what I want to do for everyone, your children and grandchildren, give them the same opportunities and better future that I enjoyed. And if you support me, I know that we can build a better Britain. A Britain where the birthright of every child is a world-class education. A Britain which is built on hard work, aspiration, and hope. A Britain where we lead the world in setting the standards for integrity, decency, and leadership. And a Britain where we have enormous pride in our history and enormous confidence in our future. Now, before we get to building that, we have to deal with some immediate challenges facing us today. Three in particular. We have to restore trust. We have to rebuild the economy. And we have to reunite our country. In order to restore trust, the first thing we have to do is to be honest, because that's how you do it. Now, in this leadership election, you've seen from me, I haven't taken the easy road. There are plenty of things I could have said that would made my life easy, but I wanted to be honest about the challenges that our country faces and what is going to be required to fix them. Even though it hasn't made my life easy, it is the honest thing to do, and that's what leadership is about. Now, the other way to restore trust is to deliver on the things that we say we do that are important to people. And that's why I set out a plan to tackle the NHS backlogs because we're reaching the point where millions of people are anxiously waiting for the treatment that they desperately need and deserve. We can't let that happen, and I will grip it and fix it. That's why I set out a plan to tackle illegal migration, because far too long we have watched on our TV screens people coming here illegally. And yes, this is a compassionate and welcoming country that welcomed my family, but we must also have control of our borders, and as Prime Minister, I will finally grip that problem and solve it and restore trust back in the system. Now, you all know we have to rebuild our economy. And you all know that the number one challenge we face right now is inflation. People's bills rising. We need to grip inflation because it is the enemy that makes everyone poorer. It reduces their living standards. It erodes their hard-earned savings. It pushes up mortgage rates. And I will grip inflation and get it back down. We'll also help people with the cost of living, energy bills this autumn, which is why we will cut VAT on fuel. But what I won't do is embark on a spree borrowing tens and tens of billions of pounds of unfunded promises and put them on the country's credit card and pass them on to our children and our grandchildren to pick up the tab. That's not right. That's not responsible. And it's certainly not conservative. But of course, once we grip inflation and ensure that mortgage rates don't rise and cripple people, I'm going to cut taxes. Because I'm a conservative, of course I'm going to deliver tax cuts. I want people to keep more of what they earn. Because hard work is something that I value above everything else. I want to make sure that we cut taxes for business so that they can invest and innovate and grow. And we're also going to grow the economy by taking advantages of Brexit, which I was proud to support. 
And as Chancellor, I started to deliver on some of the radical things that we can do differently. New free ports across the country, reforming all our regulations in data, in life sciences, in financial services, to ensure that the United Kingdom is the best place in the world to start a business, to grow a business, to innovate. Because in the 21st century economy, that's how you drive growth and create better jobs. And my experience means that I am the best person to lead our economy into that future. But lastly, we have to reunite our country. Now, in just a couple of years' time, we have to do something, all of us in this room, that has never been done before in British political history. And that is to win a historic fifth election term. That is going to be a challenge. But I know we can do it together. But in order to do it, we are going to have to appeal to swing voters in every part of our country, north and south, remain and leave, urban and rural, Scotland and Wales. And I believe with all my heart that I am the person, I am the candidate that gives our party the best opportunity to secure that victory and ensure that the Labour Party and Keir Starmer never walk through the doors of Number 10 Downing Street. So those are what we're going to do. Restore trust, rebuild the economy, reunite our country. And in conclusion, let me say this. Now, I know the polls say that I'm behind in this race. I know that there are people who say this should be a coronation, not a contest. But you know what? I heard that once before, seven years ago, when I arrived in Richmond, North Yorkshire. And ultimately, the members there gave me the greatest honor of my life when they selected me to be their candidate, to be their member of parliament. Many of them are here tonight, and I owe them an enormous debt of gratitude for placing their faith in me. And they have supported me unfailingly every day since. And today, I'm asking for all of your support and I promise you, I am going to fight for every single vote. I am going to fight for the conservative values that are core to who I am and what I stand for. And I am going to fight hard for the argument that we should not mortgage our children and our grandchildren's future to make our lives easier today. And if you select me as your leader, as your next Prime Minister, I know we can build that better Britain that I talked about. But I also know that just like I did in Richmond, I will work my utmost to make each and every one of you enormously proud. So thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Mind you, of course, you have your opportunity to put questions to both the candidates in just a few minutes' time. Now, could I ask you all again, please, put your hands together. Please welcome the Right Honourable James Cleverly, MP. Thank you. Thank you. Nick, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. You are all here to make a decision. You are all here to decide. And you're here to decide who is going to be the next leader of our party and who is going to be the next prime minister of our country. I'm gonna let you in on a secret. I have already decided. <laughs> I have already decided. Uh, and that decision was easy for me. And I'm going to explain why I came to the decision that I came to and why I hope you will come to the same decision. I am supporting Liz to be the leader of our party and our prime minister. I've known Liz for years. 
And I've known her as an activist. I have known her as an association chair. And I have known her as a local councillor. And I know that she knows what it takes to fight for every vote and to serve a local community. And I know that she knows that you don't get anything for free and that you have to work hard for everything. That's why I trust her to be the next leader and the next prime minister. And I also know that she has championed the views that she believes in for decades. Keeping taxes low. Not just saying it, doing it. Promoting freedom, not just here in the UK, but also around the world. And I know that she is passionate about bearing down on big and wasteful government. That's why I trust her to be the next leader of our party and the next Prime Minister. And I have seen her in action around the Cabinet table. I have seen her make the most of the opportunities that Brexit has delivered. Getting those trade deals done when she was Trade Secretary. Remember, those trade deals that all the smart, clever people told us would never happen, she got them done. I've seen her pushing for less red tape, lower taxes in government. I have seen her do it. And perhaps most importantly, I have seen her stand up to Iran and stand up to China and to stand up to Russia. I have seen her over and over again delivering for this country. I trust her to deliver. That's why I'm supporting her. That's why you should support her. And what I'm now going to do is give you the opportunity to watch a short video explaining it in a bit more detail. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The United Kingdom is a great country. And I know that a United Conservative Party can unleash the potential of all the people who make our country so great. To win the next election, we need to deliver, deliver and deliver for the British people. I know that our country's best days lie ahead. I'm the candidate with a clear vision for the future who can drive change and get things done. As Trade Secretary, I negotiated deals with allies like Australia and Japan, creating opportunities around the world for British business. And as Prime Minister, I will continue to deliver on the opportunities of Brexit. I will lead a government committed to core Conservative principles, low taxes, a firm grip on spending, driving growth in the economy, and giving people the opportunity to achieve anything they want to achieve, regardless of their background. I will work day and night to lead a party and a government that puts more money in your pocket and secures a better life for you and your family. I've consistently delivered when I have said I would. And I love our country. I want the best for us all. And I'm the person to deliver that. Please welcome Liz Truss. Friends and colleagues, it's fantastic to be here in Leeds, my old stomping ground. I grew up in this great city. I went to school at Allerton Grange and Roundhay. I hope there are no teachers of mine in the audience, and if there are, I'm really, really sorry. <laughs> I bought my first Whitney Houston album at HMV in Brigitte, and my mum and dad still live in this fine city. And what I think I got from Yorkshire is grit, determination, and straight talking. And that, my friends, is what I think we need now in Downing Street. Because the fact is that we face a huge global economic crisis. We have the worst war that's taken place 
on European shores happening in Ukraine. Now is not the time for business as usual. Now is not the time for the status quo. We need to be bold and we need to do things differently. And what I would do as your Prime Minister is I would launch a plan for economic growth. First of all, reversing the increases in national insurance that we promised not to do in our manifesto. I'd have a moratorium on the green levy to save people money on their fuel bills. And I'd also keep corporation tax low so we can attract investment into our towns and cities across Yorkshire and across the whole of our great country. Because I believe that we need to be on the side of people who work hard and do the right thing. People who save their money, people who start their own businesses, the self-employed, people who go into work every day. That's whose side I'm on. I'd set up new low tax investment zones that enable those businesses to start up in areas that have been left behind. I'd abolish the top down Soviet housing targets that we have across our country. Now, before I became an MP, I was a councillor. I sat on a planning committee. And those are hours of my life that I will never get back. <laughs> because we know, we all know how appalling the planning system is. And why should it be the same in London as Cornwall, as Yorkshire? I want to give power back to local people. And why should the transport here be so bad? Now, I remember as a teenager getting the bus into Leeds city centre because there was no other alternative. I'm afraid, my friends, it's not much better now. Leeds is still the largest city in Europe without its own metro network, and I would work to fix that. And I will get Northern Powerhouse Rail built. And I'll also, I will also, I don't, I don't know if we've got any farmers in the audience today, but I will also help the brilliant farmers here in Yorkshire who produce great beef and lamb, fantastic Yorkshire rhubarb. I would help them by removing red tape and help them sell their fantastic food across the world. We need to unleash, we need to unleash the potential of our great country. And we need to be bold to do that. And I'm the person that can take those steps. But we also need to continue to stand up to Vladimir Putin and the appalling war that he has waged in Ukraine. We were the first European country to send weapons to Ukraine. We put on the toughest sanctions of any country in the world on Russia. And I would not let up until Ukraine prevails and Putin fails. But we have to recognize, we have to recognize, we have to recognize that we need to spend more on defense. Because after the Cold War, we let our guard slip. We allowed the aggressors to expand. And that is why I would put defense spending up to 3% of GDP by the end of the decade. Because there is nothing more important than freedom and democracy. And we simply can't allow this situation to continue. But as well as freedom and democracy abroad, we also need it at home. And I know we've got an audience full of straight-talking Yorkshire people who know that a woman is a woman. <laughs> and and people, people, who believe, people who believe in free speech. I love our country, warts and all. And I'm proud to represent us around the world. And I want to do all we can to encourage our fellow citizens to love their country too and unleash its full potential. And finally, my friends, we need to be proud of who we are. We need to be proud to be conservatives. I'm going to campaign as a conservative and I will govern as a conservative. The people who voted for us in 2019 in seats like Keithley, in seats like Dewsbury, they didn't vote for us because they wanted Labour policies. They were fed up of the Labour Party. They were fed up of the failing Labour councils. They voted for us because they wanted opportunity, because they aspired to better things, 
because they wanted enterprise in their area. And that is what I, as your Prime Minister, am determined to deliver. Now, since I lived in Yorkshire, I have um, relocated to Norfolk. And I have, I'm afraid to say, and I, I'm afraid to say this at Elland Road, I've become a supporter of Norwich City FC. <laughs> They're a fine family club. You know, what can I say? Delia's a great woman. Great cookbooks, I think you can all agree. But I do want us to channel the spirit of Don Revy. Because we need to win. We need to win. And my friends, we can win against Keir Starmer, who is a patronising plastic patriot. He is beatable, but he is only beatable if we deliver. And I can assure you, if you select me, if you elect me, I will work my socks off in number 10 to deliver all of the promises we made in 2019 and to live, deliver a victory for the Conservatives in 2024. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, Liz Truss, thank you very much for that. Just to explain, there is a brief break now, around 10 minutes. And then, of course, I have a few questions, but you do the majority of the questions. I remind you, look for the people in the white hoodies to make yourself known around 10 minutes now. Then, ladies and gentlemen, when you can either have a comfort break or a drink, or if you're quick, a bit of both. See you in 10 minutes. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Right, that's fantastic. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Right, just before we begin, to remind you, look for those people who have the hoodies on. Uh, great welcome to everyone joining us now on LBC and Global Player, taking this live, so your questions are going out to the whole of the country and the responses. And on the subject of responses, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you hear something you like, let it be known, cheer, whoop, holler. If you hear something with which you're not that happy, I'm sure both Mr. Sunak and Mr. Truss would say it's helpful to know where they stand. So lots of audience involvement. Your questions in just a few moments. Let's really put them through your paces. Enough of the pollsters. It's now over to you guys. So, ladies and gentlemen, hands together if you would. Rishi Sunak.
Hello, sir. Good to see you. Thanks you for too. coming. How are you? Here? Yes, yes, indeed. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Sunak, do I detect the smell of burning rubber? Have you performed an extraordinary U turn over your decision with VAT on energy bills? Last week it was unconservative. Now it's a policy. Are you flipping and flopping? Oh, gosh, no, definitely not. There's two very different things here. Now, we've got a short term problem with energy bills which I always said as Chancellor, we would need to continually make sure that the support we had in place was appropriate for the scale of the challenge that millions of households are facing. Now, we announced quite a lot of support earlier this year on the basis that energy bills would rise to about £2,800. And for the most vulnerable families, that gets to about £1,200 of help. But now, as you can see in the news, people's expectations of what will happen to energy bills in the autumn has gone up. And so it's reasonable that there's more that we can do, and that is the policy that I would put in place if I was elected PM. No, but that is a temporary and time-limited support to help people over the, the winter but through to next year. But it was unconservative last week, Mr. Sunak. No, what's unconservative is permanent unfunded I tax see. cuts. There's a big difference between things that are temporary to help a, a short-term problem and permanently borrowing 40, 50 billion pounds every year uh, and not, having, not paying for that. That, that, I think it, that, I think, is a big difference. Without wishing to be too confrontational, you were Chancellor until a few weeks ago. UK growth is set to be the worst in the G20 besides Russia. Another study says we will go from 18th to 31st out of 38 OECD countries. Members here see their pounds shrinking probably as fast as they see their high streets closing. Why should we take financial lessons from you? Well, if you, you're picking the one year, if you look at actually the period in both of those forecasts, you'll see that we're either the, the second fastest in the G7 or indeed in, in, and much higher in the OECD. So we had a faster recovery than other countries out of COVID, and we were growing faster than last year and this year, and unsurprisingly, they're catching up. So if you look at it over the period, you're we're actually... You're where the economy is. We're, we're actually... No, no, if you're saying that we're bottom of the pack is what you're trying to allege, right? Yeah. So if you look at well, over the period we're actually ve very much in line or to the top end on the G7. But of course I want to see growth growing, Nick, right? Of course. Now, th we have to think about how to do that because we've had a very narrow conversation so far about tax. And actually, in a 21st century economy, there's f many other things that we've got to get right. If you want to grow the economy today, you need to make sure that our financial markets are reformed so we can get m businesses the money they need to grow. We need to have a visa regime that attracts the best and brightest from around the world. We need to do regulation differently to make sure that we support people who are trying to create new things. Now, those are some of the ingredients about growth in the 21st century. That, that's what I think we need to do. That's what I will deliver as, as Prime Minister. And, and that starts with getting businesses to invest more in the economy. Right? And, and actually, this autumn, what we need to do is reform our business taxes to get business to investing more, to creating better jobs and higher wages. That's, that's the kind of thing that we need to do to drive up those growth rates. If I were to ask you who's been the best ever leader of the Conservative, and why, Conservative Party and why, who would you pick? I would probably, well, probably Margaret Thatcher. Why? Why? Because she delivered multiple election victories and changed this country for the better. You were in Grantham, I think, on the weekend, the home of... Margaret Thatcher, how would she have responded to the fact that you're the first Chancellor since Labour's Dennis Healy in 1974 to raise corporation tax? I think she would have responded, as I have done, in gripping inflation first. And if you remember her early budgets and actually what we had to do as a country at that phase, it was, even though it was difficult, she understood that you have to get a grip of inflation first and get a grip of public spending and borrowing. That was very much her mantra, was do that first, because if inflation had run out of control and made everything worse for families, it would have been far more damaging for the economy. And it was only once she had fixed that, once she had got borrowing under control, that she embarked on a program of supply-side uh, reform. And that is exactly, that is exactly she, the same path that I want to follow. She would have supported the high level of corporation tax, you're saying? You say, you say high level. It, well, it's still, 1974, right, we go it's, back. It's, it's, it's the lowest rate of corporation tax in the G7 group of economies that you just talked about. It's actually the fourth lowest in the G20 group of economies that you also talked about. I don't mm. think anyone can say it's a high level by international standards. But it's but actually, but, but, but actually, this is the thing. If you want to drive growth in an economy today, you need businesses to invest. And we tried having a very low corporation tax rate as a means to get businesses to invest. And you know what? We didn't just try it for one year or two years. 
We've tried it for a decade, and it hasn't worked. So the question is, for people who think that we should have an even lower corporation tax rate, but not have what I'm proposing, which is actual tax cuts on business investment, the question for them is, well, how, why is that going to drive growth? Because we've tried it for a decade, and it hasn't worked. Because businesses haven't invested that money back in the economy. So if you want growth, right. if you want productivity, if you want better jobs and skills, we need businesses to invest more. So I would cut the taxes on business investment. And a lot of support in the room. Uh, three yes or no questions, which I'd ask you to answer with a yes or no, and a brief, a brief explanation, if you would, just so we get a sense uh, a little bit more, more of you. Mr. Sinak, would you support the return of grammar schools? Yes. Um, why? Well, but as you heard from me earlier, I believe in educational excellence. I believe education is the most powerful way that we can transform people's lives. But I also think there's a lot we can do with the school system as we have it. Now, what Michael Gove did several years ago was transformative. And Michael took on some vested interests, challenged consensus, brought in some reforms that mean that millions of our children now are better off. Right? Now, but that's a conservative way to do it. It's not about throwing more money at the problem. It's about reforming the system to get better outcomes. And that's what I would do with education as well. To our water supply in England, it is now at record pollution levels and in some cases record waste. There is a move that water bosses who continually pollute the water and ignore waste should go to jail. Yes or no? Uh, well, I think we've just passed a bill that puts very stiff penalties and fines on those uh, company directors and holds them liable for those. I, 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 I'm not going to give you a, a yes or no answer to a, a, making something a criminal offence in the middle of, a, of, of an, a leadership campaign. But I do Why? think water companies should be held to a very high standard. But We've not, passed legislation to do that. But not necessarily imprisoned? Uh, n not necessarily, because I don't know enough to know that that is the right course of action for what is a civil matter. But I do think they should face very stiff penalties, and that's what we've done. Finally, you talked on this se section, you talked a lot about rebuilding trust. Everybody in this room knows so much crime is driven by the drug trade. I have to ask you, have you ever used illegal drugs? No. Thank you for that. Let's move on. Your opponent, Liz Truss, has said how she would beat strikes and strikers. How would you? Uh, I, I, I think in the same way, because we have a well, manifesto. Do explain. Uh, we have a manifesto commitment that I would like to deliver on, which would legislate for a minimum level of service for critical industries like rail. That's something that we've promised to do anyway, and we should get on and do that. Okay. Can I talk to you a bit about Boris Johnson? The Ukrainian President Zelensky has said, I want him, Mr. Johnson, to be somewhere in politics in a position to be someone. I don't want him to disappear. The decision is in the hands of the British people. Were you to become Prime Minister, would you deploy him as our envoy to Ukraine? or something else, and what would his skill set be? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure if he'd want to do any of those things, Nick, but he obviously is someone who has enormous talents and I'm sure can continue making a contribution to public life. So you would support him if he wanted to, to become the Ukrainian uh, envoy to Ukraine? I, I, I'm not going to sit here and, and try and allocate jobs to people. I don't think that would be appropriate. But I think actually now we do need to move forward. I've already been clear. I don't see that being a role in the cabinet. But you know, I'm sure Boris will continue to have a role in public life. He's an extraordinary figure and I'm sure he's got a lot more to give. So you wouldn't offer him a job? Uh, not in the cabinet, no. Okay. He spoke today of periods of difficulty being inevitable, and I think we've referenced people will be looking at £500 per month for energy bills. What is to be done? Well, as, as, as we already talked about, there's support that I already announced as Chancellor that will help people through the autumn and winter. It's particularly targeted on the most vulnerable, uh, and we can go further as bills seem now to be higher than people expected earlier. And that's why cutting VAT on fuel will put extra money in people's pockets. Last question on Boris Johnson, I assure you. It's reported around 14,000 members of the Conservative Party want his name back on the ballot. What would, <laughs> what would you say to them? Well, I, I'd say to them that I think close to 60 people resigned in Parliament. And, uh, and it's incumbent on the Prime Minister to have the confidence of the Parliamentary Party and that wasn't there at the end. So whether he's on the ballot or not, ultimately you need to be able to... That's the last question from me, or the, certainly the last but one. I think you'd probably allow that your senior cognate colleague, Ben Wallace, would bring a lot of support to your campaign or to your opponents. If Mr Wallace were to be watching now, what would you say to the Defence Secretary to bring about him to support you? 
No, I'm sure Ben will make up his, uh, his own mind. But when it comes to the topic more broadly of defence spending, uh, I was a Chancellor that supported Ben with the largest uplift in defence spending since the end of the Cold War. And we did that before we had settled any other department in the middle of COVID because it was incredibly important. And I was also the Chancellor that ensured that we supported Ben to get £2 billion worth of support to Ukraine to stand up to Russian aggression. I, I, you know I'm going to hold you to a number. We heard earlier that your opponent would look at a 3% increase over a period of time. Can I get a number from you, Mr Sunak? No, because I don't believe in arbitrary targets. And what I've said is our approach to defence spending uh, should be threat-based. And if Ben Wallace was here, if you told him, Ben, I'm going to give you 3% tomorrow, what would you do with it? He would tell you, I can't spend it is what he would do if you told him that and if he was sitting here, because that's what he's told me in the past. Uh, but I will spend whatever it takes to keep our country safe. And I'm not going to sit here and get into some auction of more tax cuts and higher targets. Okay. Uh, on a lighter note, prediction for the football on Sunday, England v Germany? Ah, der Classique, as it's been called. <laughs> yes. Oh, well done. Well, there we go. Yeah, no, well, you know, Lions victory, here we come. You, a Lions win? Obviously. I okay. mean... <laughs> okay. When did you last go to a women's pro game? Gosh, when did I, no, I don't know, actually. Uh, I don't know. I'm a Saints fan, and th th that's my team. The last oh, football it? match I went to in this job was with the, was the European finals. OK, all right. Yeah. Round of applause, please, for Mr Sunak taking my questions. More importantly... <laughs> thank you, Mr Sunak. Thank you. Right. right, now, who's got a question, please? Right. OK, there's a lady there in a blue and white striped top. No, you've been usurped. One of the two. No, it is the lady in the blue and white top. Let's start the clock now. Uh, just your first name, if you would, and your question to Mr. Sunak. Hi. Say your name again. I'm so sorry. It's Laura. Laura, go Hi, ahead, Laura. Mr. Sunak. Hi. Um, will you? you sit down. Whatever you want, sir. Okay. Whatever you feel comfortable. Will you outright ban greyhound racing, or at least consider the ban, considering it is a vile and abusive sport? Well, I, to be perfectly honest, it's not something that I've looked into in any great detail. So, uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm happy to look at all our laws to make sure that we're treating animals properly. As Laura, someone... in a sentence, why should it be banned? In a sentence, if you would. Thousands and thousands of dogs are abused every year okay. and are culled. And okay. for every three that's on a track, every one that's I mean... on a track, two have died. Right, that's a horrific... I, sent, I mean, in fairness, Mr. Sunak, it's not a question even I've heard often. But it's something uh, you know you what, as, a, I, it's, as I said, I'm happy to look into it. I, for the first time, I'm a dog owner, because a year ago, my, my kids and wife con conspired against me and we got a new dog for the first time in my life. So I am happily in your camp I trust of you're being... you're a dog lover now. N now well. I am a dog lover. Yeah. So you don't lose the audience. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. Well, no, it was the best thing that happened to our family in a long time. So it's very good. <laughs> So I'm very much happy to look into okay. that because obviously now, now that Nova is a part of our life, the idea that someone would be abusive to dogs is something that I find personally obviously very difficult. May I ask the breed, Nova's breed, what is it? She's a Fox Red Lab. Fox Red Lab. Okay, sir, uh, white blazer behind, to your left, Mr Sonek. Your yeah. name, sir? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Rishi, I'm a councillor for Selby District Council, business and communities, very passionate about businesses. And how do you feel about keeping the small business relief as so many business so rely on on it um, if you became prime minister would you consider scrapping that or continuing it because i think a lot of businesses particularly on the high street yeah. would close without that relief police particularly after covid yes you know what? you're totally right and that's why as chancellor i made sure that this this year there's a 50 percent discount on business rates for retail and hospitality businesses to help them recover from covid because uh, they are the beating hearts of all our high streets. And as you heard me talk about Eat Out for Help Out earlier, I'm a passionate supporter of high streets and the hospitality industry. But we also can do some other things. We need to make sure that digital companies are paying fair taxes. And as Chancellor, I organise a deal with lots of other countries to ensure that our large online companies pay fair taxes to level the playing field. Thank you. And, and we also need to support businesses to grow which is why I created a programme called Help to Grow so that small and medium-sized businesses can get management training and mini-MBAs and figure out how to use new software to help their businesses make more money and grow. So that's how, in a new 21st century economy, we've got to support your businesses, help them to, to grow, and that's what I'll do as PM. All right. Mr. Zunak, you stay seated. I'm going to get up to work at the back of the room, but while I do, take a question, if you would. Uh, lady in a grey top, your name, if you would, first, please. Uh, Teresa. Hello, Teresa. Hello, Mr. Sunak. What I'm interested in is how you're going to control the illegal immigration. 
with the dinghies coming over, a civil service that doesn't want to actually cooperate, a border force that doesn't want to turn boats around, Macron who's empty in his country. So we can't afford it. And we've also got a processing issue of a big backlog. So I'd like to hear in detail how you're going to do it. Yes. Well. Well, I'm so, so glad you asked the question, because as you heard me in my opening remarks, that's one of the things that I want to grip as quickly as possible as PM. And if you've got five minutes when you go home tonight, find my website. There's a video that I've put out that explains a very detailed 10-point plan on how to do it. So I'll, some of the things that we need to do quickly, what we need to do is change the definition of what counts as asylum, and we should move away from the very expansive ECHR definition which allows people to claim all sorts of spurious reasons for being here, and move to the tighter definition under something called the Refugee Convention, as other countries do. That will help us ensure that we can remove people when we want to. Secondly, we should make our foreign policy more linked to people taking back failed asylum seekers. If we're going to trade with countries on a preferential basis, if we're going to provide aid to countries, they, sh they really should be taking back asylum seekers that we want to make sure are not here anymore. That's not happening currently. We need to improve the current system because it takes far too long to get people through it. We can use technology to help us do that, but we also need to look at our rates of rejection and acceptance. And if you compare us to all the other countries in Europe, subject to all the same rules, somehow we reject far fewer asylum seekers than all those other countries. So something is not working in the system, and I will get a grip of that as well. But look, if you've got five minutes, go home. There's a 10-point plan that I've put out in a video. But I'm, I'm the product, as I said, of this country's compassionate, welcoming embrace to millions of people over the years. Of course, we're going to keep doing that. But we must have a system of control for our borders. Immigration should be legal. It should be orderly. It should be controlled. And that's what I'll deliver. And just. And just on a final point, uh, under your uh, prime ministership, how many people do you think you would manage to get to Rwanda, to the programme there, and in what time span, Mr Sonnet? Well, that's a great policy, but we do need to make it work. And over time, I hope it can be scaled up. But it's right that we start well, with a pilot. Gone. It can't be scaled down. Well, no one's gone. Well, that's because, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, that, that's because we've got challenges, as we always knew we had. And when we designed but you that policy... It can work. you believe you I will do be believe able to, work. under your yes. watch, you will get people yeah. to Rwanda, yeah. but you'll decline to give me a number? Well, because we have to build okay. it up over time, right? Okay. So, but it's, part of it is a new Bill of Rights that we're actually about to put through Parliament. Part of it is my idea to change the definition, and I said there's other things that we can do that will You happen. might want to swing around. There's right, a, who have we got over here? with a blue... Oh, here we go. He's, right. got your, he's got your name on the T-shirt. I don't know right. that happened, but there we go. <laughs> Um, Rishi, we're out of the European Union, but we're seeing a real threat to our own union with a lot of sabre rattling in regard to Scotland. Mm. How are you going to keep Scotland in the UK? Yeah, no, look, that's an uh, absolutely vital question. And, it, we're, you know, we're, on, we're under real risk. The, most, uh, you know, the, the best things we can do are be firm with Nicola Sturgeon about another referendum. We need to make sure that in government in Whitehall that we don't, just devolve and forget, which for many years has been the institutional imperative where we just push things over to them and then we forget about it. Now, we as UK government ministers have to be more active in Scotland. We have to be more active about delivering benefits of the, on the ground to the people in Scotland and working constructively there to do that. And crucially, when you're countering nationalism, we can't just talk in arguments to do with our head. Now, it's easy to talk about borrowing and debt and trade and pensions and currency, but ultimately nationalism is a seductive and romantic idea. So we have got to make arguments about the union that speak to people's hearts and speak to their emotions, because if we focus just on the practicalities, we will not be successful. And I think we can do that, because my grandparents, when they emigrated here, they didn't emigrate to England, they didn't emigrate here because it was geography or lines on a map. They emigrated to the United Kingdom, and that's because it represented a set of values and ideas, and it's those values and ideas that are precious and that form the bonds of union, and those are the values which we must defend. When, when Nicola Sturgeon says Boris Johnson has done great damage to the United Kingdom, the union, is she right? Well, the, the, I mean, Boris Johnson has, has made sure, actually, that we passed a piece of legislation that allows us now for the first time to actively go and do things in Scotland and demonstrate the benefit of the union in places like Scotland. He deserves credit for that. And that is now allowing us to do something that we could never do before. And it's making a real difference on the ground. So where should the Northern Ireland trade border be? 
uh, that we don't need to have a border in Northern Ireland. We should have free-flowing trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and we should have free-flowing trade between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. But it's not working currently. Uh, and that's what we need to fix, and we will and, fix uh, it. And, and it, you'll fix it in a sentence, yes, how? Yes, we will. But, but, but how? We, we've got a bill in Parliament that will fix it. That you're confident that will work? Yes. Uh, we have a question. Gentleman in a blue suit, I think. Sir. Good evening. Thank your you. Your name, if you would, your first name. Henry from Tatton in Cheshire, just on the edge of Manchester Airport. This party has been brilliant um, in its vision for the Northern Powerhouse, for net zero, and for levelling up. But this isn't being delivered and isn't at the centre of this campaign. And the, no the Treasury seems to view the North as a cost, not a great value for money investment. Please give us the detail on how you will secure green investment and growth to truly deliver net zero and levelling up in partnership with local communities and businesses. So, so Henry, uh, you know, I'm going to actually completely disagree with you, right? So I've been in charge of the Treasury for the last two and a half years. I'm the most northern chancellor that this party has had for something like 70 odd years. I'm the chancellor that put the Treasury in Darlington, not just in the north, but also not in a big city where everyone expected it to go, but to a place like Darlington to demonstrate our commitment to it. I'm the chancellor that signed off on the largest investment in rail infrastructure across the north. Right? I'm also the chancellor that you talked about green energy, created a free port using the freedoms that we had from Brexit to come up with a brand new policy that right now in Teesside is attracting investment and jobs in the industries of the future, in offshore wind, in hydrogen, in carbon capture and storage. And if you just think back five years ago to a place like Teesside, we had lost a steel plant. 5,000 people lost their jobs. And you look at it now, it's a place that is brimming with opportunity and optimism about the future. Now, I work with people like Ben Houchen and local people there to help deliver that. And I want to bring that same degree of optimism and excitement across this country and across the north. I've done it as chancellor, and I will definitely do it as prime minister. All right. Would you support relocating the House of Lords in no. the north? Oh, and why not? Because I don't think it makes sense for the practical operation of government for us to be separated. We go over this side of the room. A uh, gentleman in a blue shirt. Your name, sir? Stuart. Hello, Stuart. Hi, Stuart. Uh, hi, Rishi. Um, at the tail end of your chancellorship, um, you had differences of view with Johnson about finances. Um, however, Johnson supported Ukraine right from the front, and he led this country. Would you do all that it takes to support Ukraine so that we defeat Putin? So, the, the quick answer is absolutely yes. And you know, I made sure that we got the funding across government to provide to Ukraine to get them the arms they needed to stand up to Putin. I worked with Ben to prioritize funding to, for, so that he could do that. But I also work with all my finance ministers around the world to put together a sanctions package, the likes of which we have never seen. And you all know those sanctions are all economic in nature. They target the central bank's reserves. They target gold. They target Russian companies. They target their access to international capital markets. Right? So those are all things that I worked on with Janet Yellen, with my fellow colleagues in Europe, because they work better when we do them together. So that you've, I've got a track record of making sure that we genuinely support Ukraine, not just directly with arms, but also that we tighten the vice on Russia to put Ukraine in the strongest possible position. That's what I did as Chancellor, and I can assure you that I will continue to do that as PM. You mentioned Vladimir Putin. Were you to meet him face to face as Prime Minister, what would you say, Mr. Sunak? I, I, I mean, there's, at this point, not much to be said. I mean, what we need to do is put Ukraine in the strongest possible position so that they can sit down. I mean, some people Vladimir say there's Putin. a lot, you know, say stop. Well, I, mean, I think we've said that already, right? right. So, so okay. I, I think we need action, not words, at this point. And the action we need is the toughest possible sanctions to make life as difficult for him as possible, and the strongest possible support for Ukraine so that they can defend themselves and push back. Now, if we do both of those things, we put Ukraine in the strongest position to then try and find a, re a resolution to the conflict. And to those who say it's Russia who in some way is benefiting from some of those sanctions, how would you respond? Is that it, a fair it, critique? Uh, we need to find ways to do the sanctions in a more intelligent way. Because ultimately... They're not intelligent now? Yeah, well, the problem with energy prices at the moment, we're all seeing it, we're all paying very high energy prices. So we are all paying a price. That is how we are all sacrificing to support Ukraine. And Russia is still able 
to make money from the energy because in the short term, the prices are very high and we haven't been able to completely remove ourselves from it. Okay. So, but what we can do actually, and one of the things I was working on with my colleagues to smarter sanctions, is to look at whether we could put in place a price cap. So actually if we could have a buyer's cartel in the world where everyone would agree to pay a fixed amount for Russian energy and enforce that through secondary sanctions, which we were working on how to do, that would be a way to make sure we get the energy we need at prices that are far better for us and deprive Russia of revenue that is funding its war effort. Now that is not an easy thing to do, but that is the kind of evolution in the sanctions that we should try and do. All right, thank you for that. We're going to... We're going to stay with the right-hand side of the room geographically, I assure you. Uh, gentlemen, again, in a blue shirt, I think, sir. Your name, if you would. Good evening. I'm Matthew from Hello. West Yorkshire. Hello, Matthew. Uh, Rishi Sunak, you, you're a good salesman and you have many strong attributes, but many people continue to support Boris Johnson, who has delivered consistent, <laughs> consistently through treacherous waters and many people unfortunately see that you've stabbed him in the back. Um, he is a man who made you as a senior politician and some people don't want to see that in number 10. You're going to have to take the party in the country through another general election and you know I'm not quite sure entirely which planet you're on. David Dav Davis neither. How do you expect to take the party through the next general election based upon, uh, upon those actions? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so, yes, so, so thank you, Matthew, for asking the question. So what, you know, why did I resign? It was a very difficult decision. It wasn't one I took lightly. Uh, and you're right, I'm very grateful to the PM for giving me the job of Chancellor. But as you also saw over the past two and a half years, I gave my everything to that job. And I'm proud of my record as Chancellor, delivering for this country, delivering for all of you and made sure that we got through coronavirus. I also was proud to be part of his government uh, that achieved many things. And as I said previously, I do believe he was the only person who could have broken the Brexit gridlock and delivered that election victory. But for me personally, it got to a point where I couldn't stay. As the gentleman previously uh, also said, I had a significant difference of opinion with him on how to handle the economic challenges that are ahead of us. Uh, and at a situation like that, th there was absolutely no way I could stay. Right? There is no way that a Prime Minister and Chancellor cannot be joined at the hip with regard to economic policy, particularly at a time when the economy faces real challenges. So I was left with no choice but to resign, and I'm sad that I had to, but that was the right thing to do, and that was me acting on my principles. Now, you ask about bringing the party back together. Now, that is a fair question, and that's the right question. So all I'd point you in the direction of is look at the support that I've drawn. I have the largest support across the parliamentary party, and that support is drawn from every part of the parliamentary party. It's drawn from people who supported Brexit, people who supported Remain, people in the north, people in the south, people in rural areas, people in urban areas, MPs who have been around for a very long time and are very senior and new MPs. So I'm confident that I am well placed to bring the party back together because I've already drawn support from across the party and I will build a team that draws on all the talents and traditions of our parliamentary party because the challenges that our country faces right now are too great for us not to do that and build the best possible team to meet them and that's what I will do. You, you, you are aware you're trailing Liz Truss in the ratings at the moment to be leader of the party. I, I, I did mention that, Nick, yeah, earlier so you on. Did, yes, you, yeah, yeah. so you, you are aware of that, though, the, the, the hill that must be climbed. Just to the sentiment, did you stab Boris Johnson in the back, lastly, on that question? I, 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 I resign because the Prime Minister and Chancellor cannot be on a different place when it comes to economic policy, and we were due to try and outline an economic policy for okay. the country going so it forward. it wasn't an act of treachery. Uh, so, it? And everyone knows there was a speech that was due to be given, and as we were talking about what should go into that speech, it was clear we had very different points okay. of view. Okay. And so I was left with no choice. Last couple of minutes together. Uh, a, a young lady in a black top. No, sir. I'm afraid it's a young lady in a black top. Thank you. Your name? Hi Rishi, my name is Annabelle and on paper I should have probably have voted Labour. I come from a single parent household, I'm a working class woman and one thing that really got my mum through hard times was benefits. Now a lot of people see benefits as a long term pay packet instead of a short term solution like my mother did. So what would you do to stop benefits getting into the wrong hands for lazy people who just want to sit on their backside all day and how would you ensure that it gets to people that really need it? 
I think the last bit, you sure it gets to people who really need it, was it? Yes, yeah, so thank you. Yeah. Thank and you. About, well, a nice thank to see you, you and, and amazing job to your mum. I don't know if she's here or not, but that's, a, that's an incredibly tough thing that she's done, and she's obviously brought up an amazingly confident daughter, so enormously to her credit. Now, I completely agree with you. And just before I was leaving as Chancellor, I spent time trying to figure out how to tighten up our benefit system. Because right now, we've got more people claiming unemployment benefit than we had before coronavirus, and yet we've got an economy that is crying out for workers. Now, that can't be right. And that's why I, as Chancellor, pushed the departments to find ways to change things. We used to have a system where people could sit around for months before taking a job, and nothing would happen to them. That was wrong, and we changed that to be a matter of weeks. The next thing I want to change is something else that you will all be shocked to hear. So if you're claiming unemployment benefit, if you work just nine hours on the minimum wage, you are then freed of all the conditions, all the obligations on you to check in at your job center, to take more work. Nothing happens to you if you say no. Now that clearly is wrong, because people like your mum, who are working really, really hard, those are the people we need to support. So as Prime Minister, I will completely change that threshold. I've already said I would double it. Because if you're taking money from the taxpayer at a time when the economy needs workers and we need to combat inflation, you should be taking the jobs that are on offer. So I think as Conservatives, that's our approach. We need to do exactly that. We're going... All right. OK. One more. Go. We've got one more. We have time for one more. We've got about a, just a minute and a bit. Sir, blue shirt, blue blazer, green trousers. Yeah. An interesting right. combination. My... Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh. Oh. Thank you, Norman Hartnell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well done, sir. Well done. Well, Ali, uh, all I said, Ali, Ali, uh, you, my Ali, name, yeah, my name is uh, Derek from uh, Godson County, Lancashire. Berry ah. in Lancashire. <laughs> 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 well done, Derek. In 1975, Margaret Thatcher appointed a, a very senior past politician, really, in Peter Thornycroft as party chairman. He served the, as chairman of the party for six years. I can think of a very good Yorkshireman uh, who would serve <laughs> a similar role if he could be persuaded. How about it? Okay. <laughs> for some of us, let us in on the secret, Mr. Sunak. I, I, I mean, I, I, think, I think the gentleman's talking about my predecessor, uh, William Hay. Ah, right, yes, uh, so. <laughs> how much? How much love is there in the room for Mr. Hay? Uh, Mr. Well, Sunak. I, I, you know, Willi William is, is one of the, I think, the greatest conservative politicians, leaders, and statesmen that we've ever had. He's also been an incredibly kind supporter to me, and I've got nothing but respect and admiration for him. But you, you are a better man than I if you think we can persuade him back into politics <laughs> in the front line. Um, but uh, I, it would be enormously beneficial to all of us if he was open to that, and I'll, 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 I'll ask him. <laughs> so what about that? <laughs> That's fair enough. Derek, thank you for your question and having a sense of humour. And I'm sorry we have strict time limits. Could I please ask, ladies and gentlemen, members, your appreciation, please. Rishi Sunak. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Mr. Sonic. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Very okay, sir. You. See you again. Okay, just to remind you, thank you very much indeed. Liz Truss will be out here in just a minute. We're just slightly rearranging the set. Thank you. That was great. I'm, I apologize now. I know I didn't get to all your questions. A lot of you are glaring at me. We will, of course, have another go uh, with the other candidates, so sorry for that. And just to remind you, of course, this is out on LBC and Global Player. And, of course, everyone is watching this across the whole of the country. So hopefully that's got us enough time. It has. So, please, appreciation for your other candidate, Liz Truss. Powerful entrance there. Hi, how are you Lovely. I thought I was going to get a kiss there. No, we'll leave that away. Well, all right. Well, that's there we go. While I've had a kiss from someone who's going to lead the Conservative Party, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Question number one, Liz Truss. In February, the Kremlin put Russian nuclear forces on high alert due to some comments that you made. If you were Prime Minister, would you accidentally walk us into World War Three? The fact that Russia have spread propaganda about me is, I think, a sign that the strength the United Kingdom has shown in leading the free world in the fight against Russia and supporting Ukraine has had a real impact. 
And I take it as a badge of pride that I've been sanctioned by the Russian regime. We have stood up to Russia, and we've not just stood up ourselves, we've encouraged our allies in the free world to stand up to this appalling regime. And it's completely wrong to listen to any of the saber-rattling or propaganda. The reason they're doing that is that Putin's evil plans to take Kyiv in a few days didn't work. And we were at the forefront of exposing the intelligence, showing what he was up to, disclosing Russia's plans that helped the Ukrainians, but it also helped us win the global argument. I hear you, but I remind you, nuclear forces. Did not that, that not concern you, Liz Truss? Well, look, I don't believe that listening to Russian propaganda and repeating it helps deliver the Ukrainians' victory against Russia. Putin has said all kinds of things. There has been all kinds of saber-rattling. But what we've seen is that when the United Kingdom and the West have taken a tough stance, he has retreated. So, for example, he said there'd be terrible consequences if Finland and Sweden join NATO. We were at the front of the pack helping them join NATO. Nothing has happened. So we, we've got to not take what he says seriously and look at what Russia did. And the fact is that the West was asleep for too many years. Okay. We didn't do enough about Crimea. We didn't do enough about the Donbass. And if we don't stand up to him now, he will come back for more. All right. You, you won't need reminding. Perhaps some of our listeners or viewers or people in the room, you had senior roles under Theresa May, Justice Secretary, Chief Secretary of the Treasury, and Boris Johnson, International Trade Secretary and, of course, Foreign Secretary. You said earlier that you're straight talking. Here's a straight question. Who was better? Well, I, I've, I've served three different prime ministers. I also worked for David Cameron as well. Do you want well, to nominate him, as Theresa, And Theresa May. Look, put it this way. In the 2016 leadership election, after uh, the referendum, I backed Boris first. And then I backed Theresa May once Boris had left the race. I've always been a fan of Boris Johnson. I think he did a fantastic job as prime minister. He delivered Brexit. He delivered on the vaccine. And I was proud to serve as a loyal member of his cabinet. All right, I'll take Boris. I'll take Boris as your suggestion. Can I talk to you about inheritance tax, Liz Truss? Last year, the Treasury received a record £5.4 billion from the duty. The Office for Budget Responsibility, OBR, says that could rise to a whisker under £7 billion in a couple of years' time. Many people call it a death tax. What would you do about inheritance tax? Well, I think our tax system in Britain isn't working. It's too complicated. It's even more complicated than the American tax system, which we know is a nightmare. So what I would do is have a complete review of the tax system. I want to make it fairer for families. So if people take time out of work to look after children or elderly relatives, they're not penalised. And I would also look at inheritance tax as part of that well, review. I've, I've because I said mean, earlier... What would you mean look at? Well, I mean I'd look at the overall tax system in the round and make sure it's fair. And my view of fairness is we need to reward people who do the right thing, who work hard, who set up businesses, who earn money and who want to pass it on to their children. So I would look at it again, but I need to look at it in the round. I've already made some immediate tax commitments, reversing the national insurance increase, keeping corporation tax low to attract investment into the United Kingdom. But I would look at the entire tax system, make it simpler, and make it fairer for people who do the right thing. Does this not underscore what some critics say in that you're promising a lot of tax cuts, you're talking about looking at inheritance tax, you promised the good folk of Leeds and Metro if you can get there earlier this evening. Some economists say your figures just don't add up. You haven't got enough money to bring in. How would you respond? Well, first of all, all of the tax reductions I've promised are costed. We have £30 billion available headroom in the budget. We'll still be able to start paying down the debt in three years. But it's a false economy to raise taxes because it can cut off growth. And we know that. We know what Britain was like in the 1970s when we had high tax rates, we had minimum militant trade unions, is it choked off economic growth and it led to a recession. So I don't agree with those people who say you can just keep raising tax and the money will keep rolling in. What will happen 
is people won't want to go out to work. Companies won't want to invest in the United Kingdom. So we have to do things differently. We have to be bold. We've had slow economic growth for the last two decades. That's why we need to be different. But of course, I will be responsible, which is why I'm looking overall at the tax system in the round. But I've made some immediate pledges that are fully costed. And what's more, they keep in turn with our manifesto commitment. Okay. I believe in doing what you say you will do. And I think it is wrong, and I raised this in Cabinet at the time, it's wrong to renege on a manifesto commitment when we had the okay. money to afford that extra and we can finance hold you to that, for the Truss. NHS. You and would social never care. renege on a manifesto commitment. I would only do it, ah. and let me be, I'm being completely honest no, with you, Nick. No, of course. You know, if there was something that we absolutely had to do, for example, for national security reasons or for some massive priority, and there were some things we had to do as a result of the COVID crisis. Right. But in the case of the national insurance commitment, we didn't have to make that change, and we did, and that was wrong. Okay. A, a handful of yes-no questions. And a brief response, a brief reason, if you would, to those uh, people who have complained Love Island is misogynistic bullying and needs reining in, does it? Well, all I can say is I watched it for 10 minutes with my teenage daughter and I was completely horrified and I turned it off. And was your daughter so, equally horrified? Uh, unfortunately not, and I'm quite worried. I'm quite worried she's gone off to wa watch it on her own, but uh, <laughs> she's actually in the audience, so I won't ah. embarrass her anymore. Okay, let's move on. You once told me some months ago that you thought any British football team should boycott the Champions League football final in Moscow, noting the human rights abuses in Qatar. Should England and Wales go to the World Cup later this year? We should go to the World Cup. What we have seen in Russia invading a sovereign country was completely beyond but, the pale. But Qatar, but now, not every country in the world has exactly the same standards as the United Kingdom. And if we insisted, that every country we did business with or we traded with or we attended a football match in was, had the same standards as the United Kingdom, we wouldn't be doing business with many countries, frankly. So we've got to be practical, we've got to be pragmatic. But what Russia did to Ukraine was beyond the pale. Okay. Last on the yes or no's and brief responses. Again, we all know it's a driver of crime and huge problems in our inner cities and elsewhere. I have to ask you, have you ever used illegal drugs? No, I haven't. You become Prime Minister. There's another famous Elizabeth in the country. That would be the Queen. What would you say to her if, when you had your first audience, she reminded you that in 1994, as a Lib Dem, you voted for the abolition of the monarchy? Well, I, I have to say, I have to say, Nick, that I have met the Queen ah. in the various roles that I've had, I'm and she has been far too polite uh, <laughs> to raise what I have previously said. What and do you make almost of your as views? soon almost as soon as I made the speech I regretted it. I was a bit of a teenage controversialist and just just within these four walls yes, I was briefly yes. no one's listening no or one's watching. Listening. Don't, don't worry Liz. I was it's... briefly a member of the Liberal Democrats. I did leave it when I was twenty one, uh, when I came of age and realised the error of their ways. <laughs> All right. Another question I've asked before, who's the best leader of the Conservative Party of all time and why? Mrs Thatcher. And why? Because she... I sense again there's she, some agreement in the she, room. She turned our country around. You know, in the 1970s, we were the sick man of Europe. We had low growth. We had massive industrial problems. I mean, I was only... I was born in 1975, so I was very young at the time. I didn't see it, but... You know, you can watch the newsreels, you can see how appalling it was. And what I sensed in the 1980s is a growing sense of pride in our country and a growing sense of optimism about the future. And I think the pinnacle was when we saw the Berlin Wall fall and we saw the freedom and democracy and the pride in our values influencing the rest of the world. And, you know, she was a tremendous leader, a really world-changing leader. And, you know, I'm very, very proud uh, that she was our Prime Minister. Can I, talk... <laughs> Can I talk to you about the cost of living crisis? You'll be aware, but let me share with the audience here and the audience listening and watching, there have been some breathtaking figures for Shell profits. Quarterly profits, £9.5 billion. To put that in context, it was £4.5 billion 
last year, so it's more than double. Time for another windfall tax. I don't believe in windfall taxes because they put off future investment. What we should be doing is encouraging Shell and other companies to invest in the United Kingdom because we need to get our productivity up. We need capital investment. What I would do is create low tax investment zones, encouraging those companies to invest in our country. I think windfall taxes send the wrong message to the world. They don't send the message that Britain is open for business. And actually what we need to be doing now is using more of our North Sea reserves to help people with the cost of living. And that's what I would do alongside having a temporary uh, moratorium on the green energy levy to really help people with their bills. You it's worth noting you worked for four years at Shell. What did you learn from your time there? Well, I, I did two different jobs. I was in the petrol industry in Britain, so I'd spent a lot of time at refineries. And I also worked in the liquid natural gas industry, uh, which is now very fashionable. Uh, I was in it when it wasn't fashionable, and no one, no one knew what it was. But what I learned was how important the security of our energy is and how we shouldn't take it for granted. And I think that it's very important in the future that we never again become dependent on regimes that we can't trust. That is what's happened with Russia, less so for the UK than other European countries, but we need to learn that lesson from Ch for China as well. And we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be, you know, whether it's critical minerals, whether it's oil and gas, we've got to be very careful because these are strategic industries and we need to make sure that the UK has resilient supplies from countries that we can trust. Last year, last year you voted to effectively rework parliamentary rules to support Owen Paterson. We know what that did for Boris Johnson's reputation. Why did you do that and do you regret it? I think we all know that it was a mistake. For you and to vote that we way. shouldn't for me to vote that way as well as the government to make that decision. And no, I wouldn't do it again if I had my time again. And what we know is there's a real need to improve discipline in the Conservative Party, but also to support the welfare of our MPs. It's a tough job being an MP. I know there's not a lot of tiny violins in this audience today, I didn't but hear you know, they I do get a lot of it. abuse. You know, my colleagues get a lot of abuse on Twitter. They have to put up uh, with quite a lot. So I want to support our MPs more, but also I want to make sure that when there is a problem, we deal with it early and we deal with it quickly. And one of the things I would do as Prime Minister is move the WHIPS office back into number 12 Downing Street. They were moved out of number 12 Downing Street by Alistair Campbell and replaced by the press office, which shows the priorities of the Blair government. But we need to show that parliamentary democracy is what matters to us, and MPs are important, and we need that re restoration of standards, discipline, but also support. Can <laughs> if you're able to, I'd love you to do two quick questions in the one minute I have left remaining. <laughs> A lot of people suggest Ben Wallace could bring a lot of support to whoever candidate. What would you say to the Defence Secretary to support your campaign, Liz Truss? Well, I've, I've worked very closely with the Defence Secretary over the Russia-Ukraine crisis. You know, he is incredibly impressive. He has led not just the UK, but also the rest of the free world in making sure Ukraine has the weapons they need. And also, he's right about the defence budget. But why you know, we, we do need to why? increase the defence budget. Okay. Well, look, I'm not going to tell Ben Wallace what to do, and believe me, he doesn't like being told what to do. <laughs> so I, I think the best thing is to leave him to make his own decision. But, right. you know, I'm a huge fan of his. He's done a great job at defence. Got to ask you a score prediction for Sunday's big game, England v Germany. It's going to be 2-0 to England. Love it. What? And uh, by the way... I'm, I'm planning to attend with the German foreign minister, so there'll be massive egg on my face if that doesn't come to fruition. Okay. <laughs> and do you when did you last go to a women's football game? Um, bro, a bro few game. years ago. A few years ago, I went to Wembley. Okay. All right. I hope you have a successful. We'll all be pulling for you, I know, and the England team on that. Your appreciation before your questions. Liz Thank Trust, you. please. Thank you. Stand. We don't take questions now.
And now it is over to you. And there is a lady with a floral jacket. Um, and your name, if you would, madam. Rosemary. Hello, Rosemary. Your question to Liz Truss. I live in Seacroft, which is one of the poorest areas in I Leeds. know it well. <laughs> How will your government put children at the heart of policy making to ensure, firstly, that they are given all the support they need to recover from the experiences of the last two and a half years, and secondly, to ensure that the harms done to our children over the past two and a half years are never, ever repeated? Well, first of all, you, know, you, you are right. We should not have closed our schools and I think it has caused a great deal of damage to children. And what we need to do is help children. So first of all, I would make sure we are supporting children in the early years, which are incredibly important. We need kids who get to school to have, to be able to count, to be able to read, to be able to do all those basic things so they can benefit from a primary education. We need to focus more on getting English and math standards up. It's still a case that a third of our kids, when they leave primary school, do not have basic English and maths. And if you get to 11 without the basic skills, you are going to struggle later on in life to get a job. And look, I've got two daughters who were out of school during COVID. I know it was very, very tough for them. I know a lot of teenagers in particular are suffering from mental health issues. I'd want more mental health support available in schools, but also in GP surgeries to help children. Uh, and, and we need to put the extra effort in. Uh, I support the tutoring scheme. I think that was excellent. We need to do more of that. We need to make up for lost time with our children, because if we don't do that, we'll face real problems later on. Thank you for your question. Mr. Truss, a, a lot of, yes, indeed, show your appreciation or otherwise, of course, a lot of experts say that schools were vectors of infection. Wasn't it necessary for the safety of the school staff, the teachers, the caretakers, and the pupils? You say no. Well, there was a time, I think I remember, during COVID you you when, the schools, when, when we kept the pubs open, but the schools were closed. And much as I love going to the pub, I probably think it is less necessary okay. in a crisis okay. than, than, what, you know, than keeping schools closed. And okay. there was a huge knock-on effect on the economy, on parents, and I think we could have done things differently. But look, hindsight is a wonderful Fair thing. No. And you I, know, the Prime Minister did his absolute best. I just wanted to put the scientific question to you. Thank you for that response. Uh, Dark Suit, sir, your name. Uh, good evening, everyone, and good evening, Liz. Uh, my name is Dieter. Hello, Dieter. Hello, Dieter. Two questions, very small. One is the difference between North and South divide and leveling up. We know there have been cuts in HS2 uh, rail links. What would you do be, if you become a prime minister to um, change the um, cuts which have been made and some, con some cities, including my city, has been treated unfairly? Um, second you're question in Leeds, is I assume, sir, are you? Bradford. You're in Bradford, I'm sorry. Yes, okay. Bradford. Can I just take one question? Would you be awfully offended or did you have a, is it another, a long question that you have, It's sir? regarding VAT for small businesses. The okay. VAT threshold, which has remained £85,000 mm. and has, has been uh, uh, fixed for next two years. Okay. Would you be able to change that, especially post-Brexit? Okay. Uh, Post-COVID, uh, the small businesses have been suffering heavily. I'm very grateful for the question. Can we start with levelling up the North, HS2, and the cities that have been left behind? So Trust. What, what I would do for Bradford is proceed with the Northern Powerhouse Rail, which I think will make a massive difference. And uh, as a teenager, I used to go to Bradford to visit the ice rink. I'm a keen ice skater, and uh, it, you know, the, the connection between Leeds and Bradford is not good enough, and the rest of the and the rest of the north of England. I've also said that West Yorkshire really suffers from not having better commuter transport. It is appalling that, I mean, and we've all been stuck in traffic jams today, frankly, and we know it's holding back opportunity and growth. And the other thing I want to do is level up in a conservative way by having low tax zones to attract investment in areas that have been left behind. So we level the playing field, but we level the playing field through enterprise, through business and you know, more small business is absolutely crucial to that. Uh, on VAT, uh, we need to review the overall system of business rates. We need to look at issues like VAT. I do it as an overall part of the tax review.
but my reductions on national insurance would help small businesses as well. Okay. Uh, just lastly, sorry, the applause come there. Yes, uh, on the weekend, your colleague Kit Malthouse described HS2 as a killer whale that could rip the arm off the next prime minister due to costs. <laughs> How nervous are you about HS2? Or has Kit well, that, that has Kit sounds Malthouse like a been pitch. On, that sounds has he been like on the sherry pitch. again? That sounds like a pitch by Kit Malthouse for a job in a new government, doesn't it? That he <laughs> would be the man who could, and he's a very effective minister, of course, okay. in, in, in controlling costs. But, you know, we, we've... I, I was not sure, frankly, of the case for HS2, but we are where we are. We've signed the contracts, we've spent the money, and now what we absolutely need to do is make sure we get value for money from it. But you so he's right. He's right that we need to keep an eagle eye on costs. And just on these transport pro projects in general, they take far too much time to do. Why do they take so long? And, you know, we've got, we have got a majority over 70. I want to pass legislation to speed up these projects. We're no longer part of the EU. We should use those freedoms to do things differently and get how, things done faster. How did the EU hold up HS2? Well, I know, for example, that some of the procurement rules add extra time. There's lots of domestic problems as well. I don't deny that, Nick. But there's no reason why we shouldn't be one of the fastest countries in the world to get projects done. And we certainly aren't okay. at the moment. OK, thank you. I'm only get you don't need to get up. I'm getting up so that we can look after this side of the room. Uh, gentleman in a check shirt. Sir, your name, if you would. Peter from Tadcaster. Good evening, Liz. I'd like to ask you a question in relation to energy supply. So this, this winter is going to be very, very challenging for the people of this country. Is it time that we re-looked at shale gas extraction? Ah. So I, I support fracking in areas where people want it to happen. And I do think it can be part of the solution, as well as releasing more of the North Sea gas reserves. But more of the North Sea gas reserves will be quicker. We also need to do more nuclear power. And in particular, in particular, so we are, we are now producing small modular reactors in Derbyshire. We should be having more of those in the UK, but also exporting them around the world. So it's a business opportunity for us as well. But I agree with you, it's going to be a tough winter, and we need to make sure we're doing all we can to lower bills and increase supply. So you're, you're in favour of shale. Uh, how would you determine if local, pay, local people supported it? Well, you, you, you know, only proceed if local people, am I absolutely. right? Absolutely. So how would you know, we work out? I also think that one of the, one of the ways that we, we gain local support is for people sharing the benefits right. of, for example, gas extraction but, but would you or poll other... People? Would, would, would you send around asking them to... Vote. How would well, we we've know? We've got these things called councils who yes, can assess indeed. local opinion. I think, I, uh, yeah. Well, I was I was on a planning committee of yeah, the council, the tip, yeah. uh, so which is not, local not the best experience I've had in my life. But local authorities, local MPs, we gauge public opinion that way. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Again, don't need to move. Uh, who we're we with? Is it a young lady in a white uh, uh, jacket? Yes, please. Hello. I'll get out of your way. Hello, Liz. Thank you for taking my question. It relates some way to schools and to our young people. During lockdown, when the schools were closed, many schools, without consultation with parents, took the opportunity to remove all the girls' toilets and make all of the toilets mixed toilets. Now, we have girls across this whole country who will not go to the toilet during break times. They go back to their lessons, they put their hands up to go to the toilets, and the teacher says, you should have gone in break time. Now, I want the government, you brought in a, a policy recently that said all new government buildings would have separate toilets for men and women. I want you to bring in a policy that guarantees that our daughters can go to a toilet in a safe environment in any school in this country. So, I... I, complete, I completely agree with you. I have sought to clarify that as women's minister. I've been very clear that single sex spaces should be protected, particularly for young people, as well as vulnerable people in for vulnerable women in domestic violence shelters, uh, for example. And I can assure you, as prime minister, I would direct that to happen because our girls need, you know, it's a difficult time being a teenager, uh, being a young girl, and you should be able to have the privacy you need 
in your own loo. So I 100% agree with you and I would make that happen. OK. And a lot of support. But what of a pupil who is transitioning? Where does he, she go to the toilet? Well, first we of all... I, no, I asked, do we have boys, girls well, and well, a another? F first of all, I do not believe that under 18 should be able to make irreversible decisions about their own bodies <laughs> that they might, they might come to regret later. So I think it's very important to note that. And of course, schools should be sensitive. They can provide additional f facilities, but it should not be at the expense of protecting young girls. All right, thank you for that. We haven't done enough this, so I'll just spin you around. Uh, sir, you didn't ask before, did you? No, I just need to double check. You're in a blue shoot, a, a blue shoot, a blue, a blue <laughs> suit and a blue shirt, appropriately enough. Your question, your name first, sir. Uh, my name's Marcus. Hello, Marcus. Um, I'm here from Nottingham tonight. Um, but I was inspired... Sorry about all the Yorkshire mentions. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Hope I haven't lost your vote. You haven't. I'm here, represent <laughs> I'm here representing Nottingham because we haven't got a hustings in Nottingham, but that, I'm not bitter about that. Um, <laughs> the reason I'm here was because I was inspired by a lady who was on TV when I was 14. Of course, it was Margaret Thatcher. I grew up in a council estate, so I've been inspired by the conservative beliefs. Now living in Nottingham, and when you look at inner cities and the issues that we have in inner cities, council estates, and especially councils who use money almost to bankruptcy, what policies are you going to bring in to deal with those type of councils? Thanks, Marcus. Liz Truss. Well, I, I too grew up in Leeds, and we've had a Labour council in Leeds since, apparently since the dawn of time. And they were, they were utterly hopeless. And too often in schools, and you know, there were some good teachers in my schools, there were some not so good teachers, but too often the edicts that came from the city council were all about political correctness rather than about getting on with teaching English and maths and giving the kids the opportunities they need in life. So I completely agree with you. What we have to do is make sure that these Labour councils, these Labour mayors, are held to account and they're able to, so I agree with empowering local authorities more. They need to be raising the money they spend so that voters understand that when they're not delivering, they should be kicked out. All right. Um, you, I'm not familiar with Leeds, although my I'm current... I'm sorry to hear well, that. My Nick, current partner a, is. It's a gap. It's no, no, a gap in your education. My, my current... And you'll, I'm sure, help me. My current partner is, and she danced regularly at Mr Craig's, which was the nightclub... I, there we are, so that has to be local, so she was right. Um, you've been disobliging about the school you went to in Leeds, haven't you? You've made it sound like it was some backwards, some, what does they say, gutter comprehensive that Alistair Campbell once called them. It's nothing like it. It's a lovely, I read, it's a lovely part of town. Ours has started a million quid, and everybody wants to live there. Why were you so rude? So, I didn't say that my school bog street was... Comprehensive, I didn't, I think he said bog standard bog, bog comprehensive. Standard. We're but, there now. But... I'm not, I'm not claiming it was a sink school. It was an average comprehensive at the time. And what I'm saying is that that average comprehensive, under the auspices of Leeds City Council, there were too many kids who were able to leave school without the education that they needed. The teaching was patchy. We didn't have league tables at the time. We didn't have a national curriculum. So there were kids who fell through the cracks and also not a rough part in of town, Leeds, though, is it? Well, it's a, you know, there were, it's a very mixed intake at Roundhay School, uh, you know, and it's a good, you know, it's a good group of, of pupils. And what I found, by the way, is when I left that school and went to Oxford University, there were pretty talented people at Roundhay School who should have been at Oxford University rather than some of the people that were actually there. But what, what I felt was there were low expectations of some of the pupils in the school. And sometimes those low expectations were actually about where, the ki where those kids had come from in Leeds. Okay. So there were different expectations from kids from the middle class areas than there were from the council estates. And I thought that was wrong. Okay. And okay. I still think it's wrong. And what I don't want is kids growing up around this country who have the teachers or the schools or the council have low expectations from them because okay. of their background. Thank you, Liz Truss, and a lot of support for your view.
gentleman in a blue shirt directly ahead of me. I, I, oh, sorry, I, I was told you had the mic. We all go second. You'll go second because you've. Been, it's a man in a white shirt, I think, sir. No. Yes. Hello, I'm Graham from York. Hello, Graham. Uh, you talk a lot about growth. In fact, you both do, which is obviously good. I know a lot of small businesses in and around York who would dearly love to grow. The business is out there, but they simply cannot, cannot get the staff. What would you do about that? Well, well, you're right. You know, we after COVID, after furlough, it has been difficult getting getting staff across the country. One thing I would do is tighten up our incentives in our welfare system to encourage more people to go into work. We've still got a lot of economically inactive people who are not taking the opportunities of work and. You know, it's about encouragement. It's about making sure those job opportunities are there. But we need to do that because otherwise, the people who are working are bearing the burden of paying the cost. And of course, there are some people who can't work, but there's an awful lot of people who we can encourage to get into work. And I work very closely with Therese Coffey. I know she's looking at this issue, but that is what we need to do. We need to train up more people in the types of skills that we need and we need to make sure the incentives are there to get people into work. What, um, what impact, if any, has Brexit had on the labour market? Well, these problems that the gentleman has just been talking about, they're global problems. They've got the same problems in the United States, in Canada and across the world because we are all suffering from the global economic shock well, caused by COVID. Would not some of the so farmers you referenced earlier say they miss some European workers? You mentioned in your earlier speech, Liz Truss, are they not missing in, the in Belgians In Europe, and they Bulgarians? are also struggling to get workers on their farms as well. What we have is the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Scheme. I support that. I think we do need to make sure there are available people to work on our farms. I talked earlier about my passion for British food. I think it is important that we open up those schemes you know, on a temporary basis, on a seasonal basis, to bring those people into the country. But this is not a problem that's unique to Britain. It's a problem right. across Europe. It's a problem in Canada, America, and around the world. All right. Uh, last two, three minutes. So, uh, white um, t uh, polo shirt. Sir, your question to Liz Truss. I'll get out of your way, Mr. Okay. Truss. Hi. Uh, so, Alex, uh, living in Leeds from Birmingham. Uh, quick question about uh, child benefit. So at the moment, it currently, it currently tapers off when one earner in the house earns above 50K. There's quite a big range of combinations of earners within a household, especially with people that earn 50K that do mm. or don't have student loans as well, which yeah. makes up quite a big difference. And especially when one of the earners goes on maternity leave and can uh, yeah. you know, have quite a big impact on the household income. Is that something that you'll look into if you were leader? As, as I mentioned earlier, I want to review the tax system to make sure it's fair for families. Because at the moment, if you take time off work to look after a child or to look after an elderly relative, you are relatively penalised in the tax system. So I want to look at that. And we need to make sure the tax system works with things like child benefit so it's fair. But overall, I think we just need to simplify the system because it's so complicated for people to understand. It's so complicated for the government to administer. And sometimes the government loves complexity. I talked about the Treasury earlier, but they love these complex schemes, these combinations of benefits. And often it's just very, very hard for people to work out exactly how it will affect them. And I want to reward people who do the right thing, who look after their families, who go out to work, who start a business. And we need our tax system to reflect that. All right, if we sprint, we can get through two more. Sorry to applause again, though. Yes, indeed. Blue shirt, sir. Ah. I, I, I lose. It's Adrian from Very Conservatives. Right. A member of Very Conservatives. Uh, and the first question uh, to you uh, is... Well, you only have one, uh, sir. I'm sorry, sir. If you could get your... We've got a minute and a half. Would you have Jeremy, Jeremy Unt... Would yeah. you have Jeremy Hunt in your cabinet? Would you have Jeremy Hunt? I think certainly you wouldn't have Jeremy Corbyn. That'd be a hell of a story. <laughs> and do you, th do you think... Might lock uh, him in the wardrobe, but not in the cabinet. And, I, and I've got to limit that to you. I'm so, so sorry, sir. So Jeremy Hunt, look, I, final question. I am not thinking at this stage about cabinet dogs, but what I can reassure you 
is I will make sure all of the talent of the Conservative Party, you know, whichever part of the Conservative Party they're from, are on the front bench. And it will be on the basis of can they deliver? Are they going to be the people to get the waiting list down in the NHS? Are they going to be the people who are going to stand up to Russia? Are they the people who's going to shake up the Treasury and deliver the investment we need across our country and cut taxes? Those, that is what I will base my decision on about who is in the Cabinet. And the final question, we're going to swing round to here. I think it's a young man. Sir, would you stand up and give yes. us your first name, um, sir? I'm Patrick. Hello, Patrick. Hello. Um, we spoke a lot about tonight uh, about working people subsidising those who don't work. Well, in this country, we have a massive amount of people who don't work. Pensioners who have their triple lock subsidised by people who do work. And when increasingly young people can't afford to get buy a house, rent's going incredibly high, and national insurance hiked, so it's becoming increasingly hard to work. But people who own their houses, paid off their mortgages, and have a lot of money in wealth and equity, aren't paying, whilst working people and young people pay for them to sit at home and watch daytime TV. Well, and not a university well, popular view, Liz Truss. Well, but first of all, can I say, you know, this is one of the many reasons that we need to reverse the national insurance increase because we shouldn't be penalising families and working people. And you know, older people um, have a huge contribution to make to our society. What I think is that we should be helping older people work if they want to work. And I think we could do things like more part-time jobs. So in other countries, people tend to gradually wind down into retirement. In Britain, there sort of a, is a cutoff. And I think pe people who are older in the population have a great deal to contribute. So what I would like to do is see what encouragement, what financial encouragement we can give to get more people working part-time and to help in, in the economy. And just on the subject of houses, what would they do? can I just say... What are, have I got to go and work at B&Q now when I'm 70? <laughs> How old are you now? I'm in my early 60s, Miss Trust. Well, you've got another... Like, take Nick Ferrari, he's got another 30 years on the clock. <laughs> Don't you think? Don't you think? <laughs> I think not you have. <laughs> How would you financially incentivise them to go and work well, at home base? Uh, uh, you know, there are things we can do. I'm not talking about working at home base. I think people have huge... Ex By the way, I don't... Denigrate working at home base okay. either, but there are lots of there are lots of roles that people people can take up. And what I think is people have a huge contribution to make to our society. People are living longer, and we and one of the great things that we did under the David Cameron government is remove compulsory retirement, so people are able to choose. And I think that's really important. But on house building, the problem is we've had these top-down targets, which are decided in Whitehall. What I want to see is much more bottom-up, locally driven housing to make sure we do have the houses so that young people and, can get on the housing ladder. And are ladder. too many people sitting on their backsides watching Love Island, as, our, <laughs> as the colleague suggested well, there? Yes or no? No is the answer. All right. And I think, I think people work incredibly hard. And, you know, the people in this room are people who have given up their Thursday night to listen to you and me, With Nick the, and, 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 Rishi, yeah, and, yeah. and Rishi, and Rishi. And, you know, work incredibly hard for the Conservative Party. And we have a great voluntary party. We have fantastic people that work for charities. Okay. But what we need to do is encourage that okay. and get off people's backs so they can spend more time doing, doing things that contribute. Let me get off my backside and ask you all to a round of appreciation for Liz Truss, if you would. Thank you. Thanks very much, Liz. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. See Great you again. See you. Thank you very much indeed. Keep Liz. I hope you've got another 30 years on the clock. Of course I have. If you, if you demand it, it will happen. Yes. Liz Truss, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. The US, when they borrow money, they're getting it in 1.5, 1.9 interest rate. Africans, when they get the same amount of money, they're paying 9, 10%. The people who don't need a break, they get a break. The ones who need a break, they don't get a break. The sheer survival of the World Bank IMF is based on the fact that African countries and, and many other developing countries do not succeed. Their success is based on our failure. That has to change. And guess who can make that change? We, the children of Africa, we, the Africans, are the ones who have to say, we know your game now. Enough is enough. We're not playing it anymore. And this is where the diaspora come in.
There are more Ghanaian doctors in New York City than in, in the entire country of Ghana. There are more doc Nigerian doctors in LA than in the entire country of Nigeria. So let's be serious here. What Africa needs is capacity, capacity, capacity. And that capacity is in the diaspora. So it behooves us to bring the diaspora together. Let them understand what is really going on in our Africa. Diaspora are not going home. Diaspora are angry about Africa because they are not understanding the root cause of why Africa is where it is today. They think getting rid of a president will take care of the problem. Far from it. That president is just going to be replaced by another one who is going to equally suffer from the same difficult environment to work in. So let's look at an Africa that must be free to take care of herself, an Africa that's free from exploitation from outsiders. The multinationals who are stealing from Africa every day in broad daylight. I use an example of the DRC. If you ever fly very low over the DRC, you'll see tarmacs in the jungle. You'll see 747s flying into DRC, picking up minerals and flying right out. The same multinationals are responsible for arming young people and giving them MK-16s. Because why? Their satellites in the skies are telling them where that village is. There's, there are lots of diamonds. So what do they do? Arm young people, drag them up, and send them to go chop off a few heads. The rest of the village runs away, so they come behind and do their illegal mining. We black people must understand what is really going on. Because what we are shown instead is, oh, look at those Africans killing each other. There are some serious games that have been played in Africa for far too long. And once we understand that, we can strategize as to how we can begin to bring the difference and bring the change that Africa needs. And that change can only come if the African diaspora are united and the Wakanda villages, as I call them. It is our organized way of saying, starting with one African diaspora center of excellence, it will be a new city, a developmental hub that we can then take from there Every sector is developed. Take healthcare. How many doctors do we need in this region to take care of this many people? We pick up education, same thing. We pick up engineering. We pick up electricity. How many megawatts of power do we have in the region? How many do we need? Be it solar, be it wind, be it hydro, be it geothermal, be it nuclear. We were singing, when you were singing, the masters of the field were coming. We who are young boys are coming. The masters of the field are coming. We who are young boys are coming. To win the race, to win the race, we trust in God, we trust in God. To win the race, we trust in God. And that's for, God. And that's for Opoku, right? Masters mm -hmm. are coming. Masters are coming. Mm -hmm. Masters are coming to win the race. Oh, 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 oh. Masters are coming. And then they will sing. Prepare the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prepare the world. Yeah. Then we go more. Then we we'll keep quiet. Mm -hmm. Then we will sing. Ah, when they tire, then we will come in. Mm -hmm. Diplo, Owens. Diplo, Owens. Are we in the game? We have to win the race and take a cup. We are the masters of the field and best athletes, famous to all and decent boys. How would you prove? Then they will start. I've been quiet. They will say, I have been quiet. I am my FTO. I will prove. I will prove. Prem quiet. Echo. It's my question. One dollar, one CD. In the time of Mills and Mahama, two CDs, one dollar. If I was them, I would say to the people of Ghana, I'm sorry. We are sorry for the poor work we have done. We're going to go and think about ourselves. But that is not the people we're dealing with. The fruits of office, the money, the money under the table has become sweet for them. So they are determined to stay. Are we going to allow that to happen? Are we going to allow that to happen? In Kufo's time, one of the people who advised and helped him develop a strong CD was my running mate, Mohamedou Baumia. Then he was deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana. It's one of the reasons I brought him to come and join me, that we will work on the CD and create again a strong CD that will be able to allow us to develop our economy and allow our traders and our to be able to develop. We have told the world, we have told the world that I'm 
under our leadership, we're going to turn our back on the old economy, the raw material exporting economy, and build a new industrial value-adding economy in our country that will bring jobs for our people and for especially for the young people of our country. That is the goal of the new NPP government and the administration and the national government. A competitive labor force because we're going to give all the children of our country an opportunity. Hello, Obisha for Kofi Krantini. Nane, I levi, I levi, I levi, Kasana, Yakasagana, Ubiarika, I levi, Inti, say, say, me, ti bing me. Ni, I levi. Because I levi problem, no, a yes, simple. Now, Ghana government is on Peso, Otia, say, Inti, ne, ye, betre, much then. No, what, Tia, see ye. I was here for 2020. IMF, Ma Ghana, one billion dollars, billion with a B. Same year, no World Bank, Ma Ghana, 430 million dollars. Nina for COVID. Every year, you know, in 2021, no IMF, Sam Ma Ghana, one billion dollars view. One billion with a B. Now, World Bank Sama Ghana, 130 million dollars. In 2021, no, so one billion, 130 million, yeah, if he World Bank buy any IMF buy, no. Now, we say post COVID rejuvenation program, say, what be my young economy, no, so, into no, World Bank, the IMF, this is Ghana, Ghana. Ghana government core. Bank of Ghana could ye 20 billion cities say COVID in tea. Never shall for what World Bank come on with two billion. Uh, I am a farmer with two billion. World Bank Amamo 560 million dollars for COVID. I know on some Musan call Bank of Ghana could ye 20 billion cities say COVID in tea. Say she can move whom contain train yet. And I won't be. What move yet? Baby, I will be far with Ghana. E levy tax. We call ports. E levy. We call airport. We call hotels. But they are totally bribery. So Ghana. E levy. E levy. E levy. Says he can hear now for petrol. E levy. We call union my port. E levy. Says he can hear now for now. Inti se ne. Government peso ochre yeng se. Ghana fu ebi a ya june ne nye june inti na ode sa. E levy nereba. Yes, you have a CHR government to say. And you say, I do not need you more. You will never cost no near Jai Amano. If you say, who per se, wound ya, E levy, young, yeah, yeah, responsible citizens, yeah, per se, yeah, 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 stand by, yet, Jina Hockey car, yet, train fire, or no, I can say, yes, yeah, responsible citizens, right? Into, yeah, yeah, responsible citizens. Nana Tinney say, So who per se, would free sicker. Na would the be because young credit rating record former and yet young abra bought now the e levy barber to so I didn't because there is over three almost three billion Ghana cities a record to the presidency three billion Ghana in detail so by 75 percent what also by 75 percent I would say by 375 million dollars 375 million save and not at the presidency. You don't need three billion Ghana cities going to the presidency. Then now what are you, Mr. Kufuado? Any near Koso war presidency? Then now Modi Sikani a presidency war. Modi a then Modi show Suruku and now then now Modi. Legislature, let Ghana legislators. You have 275 legislators. Then now our legislators no why you ma Ghana? Say say many more case he Ghana fui. You bet me, Afa, I install it, Watson. IBM computer, our friend is Watson, no? Ah, hey, artificial intelligence. Ah, hey, hey, nine, over 90% of young parliamentarians, no? You bet me, I replace one with Watson. Watson computer, Ben Now, you down downscale. I then hear 275 parliamentarians out. Then we are Magana. One liability to Ghanaians in a year over 100,000 cities every month per parliamentarian. 100,000 cities. And which 
what was judiciary judiciary hey america yet 330 million people 11 times the size of ghana ghana yet 30.8 million america were nine supreme court judges ekufuado bana nsin ghana near were 10 supreme court judges ekufuado are 28 akaho into say say ghana 30 a country of less than 31 million people no yet were 18 Supreme Court judges. Ding ne how yang. 18. Ding na adding yang na just a kronger will be as in a gun and a wound tea. Yang here Supreme Court judges. Ding tin ye were Supreme Court judges. A country of less than 31 million. 18 Supreme Court judges. Ka ka one Supreme Court judge be no liability. Ebro hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Hundred and fifty thousand cities a month. Kona kubun kunta he ne V8 ordered them ne bodyguards ne ne driver ne ne te, ne krone ba deni inti ni yafa an extra eight Supreme Court judges and un kwan cheng se si ameni mokase ya wo 34 wo friending ambassadorial post around the world 34 Vatican City. Ah, a will room cry ye wo ambassador wo ho. Deng na ambassador wo Vatican City ye magana. Mun kan chile ye nge. A deng ni ye wo ambassadors wo baby to say Malta nom ne eh, wo friend deng Sri Lanka si eh, Sudan nom ni ade. Deng o komo na ye ni ade ba inti ni ye wo ambassadors wo Sudan. It doesn't make any kind of sense. Se wo re e levy. What is this? Ye san wo eh, 58 uh, uh, diplomatic missions around the world. Diplomatic mission, no, and Kahun Fasuna said, What will trade desk at the income commerce a bre Ghana? So, diplomatic missions around the world, they are 50 80. Sika Beng, what the bre Ghana? Mun country near here. A year crong waste of money and resource. Musi Muhu E levy. Your bachelor must say E levy, no, Munkona Munko Yi infimua mut for two positions now. My creator who named Fasono and Hona Munko Yinfi. I think that more how Ghana for sa MPP for think that Ghana for why you want to na debi a yenti a se yenti a se no sa positions he na he was he were over two thousand executive positions sa were executive benefits ne perks were to kwang were business class were nya four by four no money a de sa ni money ne si were you fi ho and I what also and no no be ma he levy no income from he levy ne ye be nya fi ho mroso mroso mroso. Then necessary a catch there a good for the new government. Says Sadeno, Munko ye in Fihonum, Namu Boka Gana Foka unnecessarily. Namu be ye in a ye na excavator, so Yanko Pando, me and say, Yang Sankoka, Nian Nang, and Yan Fanny Sikani and Fantu, ye levy Casson. Mabe catching the Marco Show excavators eighty five. Excavators are back on ye over hundred and fifty thousand to two hundred thousand. Massa Marco Show and Akaho. Now Pan on no way, ye zi. Cop no way, a tin way, ya no cop no so a wa bonaka ho. Eh, a kufuado and his government. Why? Gana fo. Yam penende em penetina, ye levy no, one eye as a bash and one eye, quite free scan was a ba. Yam pen. In a lay, walk when eh, 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 yan mo babbe ku ye be genome de naming say yer em penet, a kufuado and his government. A ding. A ding. What say? When uh, cluelessness meets unpreparedness, no MPP in Funi now be home. Oh, we're not gonna take this, we're not having this. Mumfa, yam penene in penetina, eleven, ye chia, munko in cockat legislature, munko cat executive, munko cat judiciary, nasi can ambassadors, any they were friending ambassadorial post. Any uh, 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 diplomatic missions, so many many now won't cancel, no more reduce, no more for computers in your hair. Legislators say, Yeah, what 275? No, you bet me the drone, drone, I replace you one. You're here 275 at the maximum four per region. You're here 64 parliamentarians. You're here 211 parliamentarians. No, where your liability to Ghana at about 100,000 cities every month. Yen chawung in fiho. Come on, enough of this nonsense. Ye wim. Ye wim. Awa yo wedding crassembo.
Okay. Okay. So when we are the class symbol of knowledge, strength, adaptability, uh -huh. energy, freedom, unity, hope, peacemaking, harmony, intelligence, Continue. power of love. Strength. Said in class symbols when you know you be a bra, bo be a be a boy. Yeah. Na ne sign ano pepper ano. Na ye di aka and in class symbols ano. Okay. Now Ghana for what na si ya unu se. Said ya na na do lang kwa kufwa do ebu ne mai no ye ni jeho. Enti this is the a in class symbol for failure. What? It's a free na de ko. Said in class symbol we unu space mi unu ya. Academic class in Boson. The president is now a free man. The co who is best in the new way. Academic class in Boson. Photo is an edding class in Boson. You are a failure. You are a failure. I beg and pay for what we are saying. Yen and Nanuma Motina see here at the class in Boson. You see, Mummy and Fa Wink. This photo is an edding class in Boson. I'm about to hear this. I'm about to hear this. I'm about to hear this. This is where you want to use your life. I'm not going to hear this. I am a boy. When? It is a castle. Oh, man, you're here, my. Hey! Then, now, a memoir and quiet, you know. Mother. I come to you.